Wow, thank you guys. Goodness, that was a surprise. A blessing to be, as Eric said, um, called here at Thrive. It's just an honor. You guys are the greatest group of church family in all of planet Earth. <laughs> and uh, we're just delighted to be a part of your life and have you be part of ours. I was at another pastor's gathering this week, and um, you know, this one for me was just one of just kind of sitting back and listening. And, um, but I was proud in the right way in my heart of, over you guys and just what the Lord is doing here. And uh, just grateful, grateful for you guys. Man, Lord's doing some great stuff, you guys. You know, Molly and I were talking about this the other day. This is a freebie right here, by the way. It's a freebie. Um, you know, we pray, for, we pray a lot for revival. I hope we do. I hope we're praying for that in each, each of us and our families and, and individually, you know. And, you know, we don't see, you know, thousands or hundreds, rather, of people crawling off the street, giving their lives to Jesus, like during many of the revivals in our, in our country and our world, right, over the years past. But when I look and see what God is doing in King George, and I hear through you guys the opportunities that you're having to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus and truth in this community and beyond, I'm going to tell you straight up, I think there's a revival going on. And I'm not saying that to be like, ooh, you know, seriously. You know, it may not be of the type and the, and the, and the, and the size, rather, that, that maybe you read about in some books. But, but so many people, I've been, I've been hearing about people who are hearing and people whose lives are being changed and hearts are being changed. Some that I might sit back and go, really them? Wow, that's amazing. That's a miracle. It is a miracle because I think God's reviving people. You know, and, and one of the things when Melanie and I came out years ago was, you know, that verse. And we're going to actually read it this morning. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul longs for you. You know, and the writer of that psalm, you know, the sons of Korah, they were down, you know, and, and, uh, but they were longing for something he didn't have. And we've seen folks, and I number you don't raise your hands, but you had checked out from church, but now you're here. And it's not about you're here. It's about you're back in a relationship with Jesus. And we're seeing that with people. And that is awesome. To me, that's what reviving is. It's taking something, a coal that was over here, and it's bringing it back in. And, 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 and it's getting illuminated again. So praise the Lord for that. I think, I think he's doing it. And, and whether or not we read about 22485 in the books of tomorrow, I don't know. But let's just relish the fact that God's doing something great. And we get to be a part of it. Right? What a blessing. Guys, we're moving on. First Samuel, we're going to be in chapter 27 today. Um, so just encourage you to open up your Bibles to First Samuel 27. Um, we're actually going to get into the first couple of verses of, of chapter 28. And uh, I know um, uh, one of the little guys who got baptized this, this uh, year was, uh, I don't like usually mentioning people's names from up front without their permission, so I won't say his name. Um, but but uh, we were talking about uh, his baptism and that, and, and, he, and he asked the question about uh, Saul and the, and the witch or the, or the medium of, of Endor. So we're not going to get there today. When, when I said chapter 28, we won't get there. We'll get there next week. So I hope he's here next week to find out about that. But this week, we, we're going we're gonna to only stick with chapter 27. Um, and we'll read that here in just a second. Let's review where we were last time together in chapter 26. Uh, here we go again. Um, Saul was, was uh, you know, chasing David, and, and David had another opportunity to take his life. Remember, he was standing over him. Saul was asleep. Uh, he had David's spear, and he could have chucked it through his forehead and been away with that dude right then and there. But he didn't. He didn't take matters into his own hands. He yielded that. He yielded the justice to the Lord, as we need to yield to him. And uh, we shouldn't act on a whim. We shouldn't act on a feeling. We should seek information. We should seek facts. Remember, David sent the, the, the spies out to make sure he was getting this information right. We don't act just on, on, a, on a gut. We want to make sure we're operating with knowledge and wisdom. But instead of running from Saul, this time David went to him. Uh, and, and amazing, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, if a man's running after me or hunting me down, I wouldn't go after him. I would run the other way. David didn't run the other way. David wanted to prove his innocence. He hopefully, I think, wanted to capture Saul's heart. He knew Saul was messed up. And I think there was a part of David that wanted to see him change. Guys, it's, it is not for us to take matters into our own hands. But that also does not mean we have to run the other way when times get tough either. And, and we kind of camped out on that a little bit last week. Well, apparently God was in all of what was happening because he put this deep sleep over Saul and his men. And David was able to enter the camp and nobody knew. Remember how David is like tiptoe. And all these men of Saul's are everywhere. And none of them woke up. Uh, you know, it's, it's not that, uh, you know, they had had a little bit too much to eat or whatever or drink last night. No, God put them to sleep. And uh, God wanted Saul to go in here. I think God had a, a lesson here. And one of those was this. When God asks us to do something crazy, he's going to make it happen. 
And the same thing is true today. You know, if God impresses on our heart to do something bold uh, for his glory, not for our fame, but for his glory, he will enable us to do that. And uh, so David, uh, David's loyal man, Abishai, wanted to kill Saul right then and there. And, um, and, you know, surely God would be okay with that, right? Because everything points to that. We're here. It's now. You know, the here and now. Here's the spear. Here's the man. Let's take him out. And David's like, no, we can't do that. God hasn't directed us to do that. And to take matters into our hands like that when God is not said to, that's a sin. David had that conviction and he lived by that. And we learned we're, we're not to be led by convenience or opportunity. Or, or situational ethics as we hear about it today, but we need to be led by a standard of morality and a standard of conviction. God, what is right? God, what do you want me to do? And regardless of whatever anybody thinks, uh, I'm going to do what you have asked me to do. So David, he gets Saul's attention, speaks from a distance, lets Saul know, hey, you've not, got no reason to pursue me and, um, and all of this. And, and uh, then, then David goes on to share kind of part of his heartache. And part of his heartache is the fact that as, as he's on the run, he's not able to worship with his people. He's been chased away from his people and from uh, the, the worship with God's people from the community. And we talked about how important corporate gatherings and worshiping God together. This morning was just a great, during song, a great time of worship under the Lord, just crying out to him. And I pray we worship him now as we're in his word, but coming together corporately and being in a community, in a Christian today, a Christian community where we have one another is very, very important. Uh, and, and so we kind of saw that come out, uh, coming out of, of David um, last time we were together. So David gives Saul his spear back. Uh, he, maybe he should have broken it with a flare for the dramatic, but he didn't. He gave it back. He's like, I don't need your spear. Uh, he wasn't about to go over in the camp and hand it to Saul himself. He sent a messenger, but we, we don't need a spear. We don't need to chuck spears at people. David, you know, he, Goliath had come at him with a spear, and he goes, keep your spear. Uh, you come at me in the spear, but I come with you at you in the power and the name of the Almighty Lord God. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to approach our situations, not with our spears and, and our frustration and our anger and what can we do to get even, but we just need to try Trust the Lord. So after a great ending of chapter 26, today we move into chapter 27, and David, we're going to watch David cave. He's going to cave this morning to the wrong thoughts. And um, what was he thinking? What are you thinking, David? And that's a question that we need to ask ourselves often, is it not? John, what are you thinking? Have you guys ever, ever had to ask yourself that question? You find yourself going down this trail of thoughts that you know are not good. And it's like the Holy Spirit comes in and says, what are you thinking? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. There's one thing that can be so destructive in our life, and that's going to be the subject of chapter 27 that we're going to look at today. So let's read this chapter together along with the first two verses of chapter 28, 14 verses in all. Uh, let's do that together. First Samuel chapter 27, beginning with verse 1. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. And David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maoch, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household. And David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so Saul sought him no more. Then David said to Achish, I have, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Um, parenthetical insert by me now at the end of verse 6. To this day, that means to the day this was written, not like today, 2023 or 2022. What year are we in? <laughs> you get the point there. So to this day, the day that this was written. Verse 7. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. When, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, hey, 
Where have you been m- m- raiding today? And David would say, uh, against, uh, against the southern area of Judah, uh, or against the southern area of the Jeremiahites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people, Israel, utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war, to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. And we'll stop there. Woo! David, what you gotten yourself into here? (laughs) Let's, Let's talk about this. Listen, God's presence, his power, his promises, his faithfulness have been so evident in David's life. Yeah, David's had some some bad times at it, right? But has God ever not been faithful to him? He has been so faithful throughout all of this. David was chosen. He was the least among all of his brothers to be the future king. He was picked to be this man after God's own heart. He wasn't just any Israel boy. He was the man after God's own heart. And God had given him a loyal friend. Remember Jonathan. And he had poured into his life. David had defeated Goliath. David had grown in favor uh, with God. He had grown in favor, if you will, with all of the men. People were leaving Saul and coming to David. He was a lovable guy. He was a likable guy. He was a hero. He was a champion in his own right. He was a a leader. He was the captain of of the army, and and he was the man that people wanted to, to, to have on their side. Again, his integrity had been proven. Yeah, he had had some slips along the way. We all do. And that's why I love the Bible because he, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave out all the times when people in, in the word mess up. I'm so thankful for that. Is anybody else thankful for that? Because when I read the mess ups in scripture, I go, and it says, and he sinned. And I'm like, amen. I mean, not that amen because he sinned, but because I do too. And when I read that of great men and women in scripture, it reminds me God can use me too. Right? So, yeah, he had some slip-ups. We all do, but God has never let him go. Again, God's faithfulness to us should serve as an anchor to keep us secure, shouldn't it? Yeah, his faithfulness. It's an anchor to hold us down. It's not the situation I find myself in. It's not what I do about the situation I find myself in. It's about his faithfulness to me. God, you are so, so good. He has been so good to us. So that should anchor us. However doesn't always happen. For a number of years at this point, we're, we're at it here in, in the chapter 27, Saul's been chasing David. He's been hunting David. And even though Saul said last week, he said, I will do no more harm to you. Remember that? Well, two weeks ago at the end of chapter 26. Oh, you know, David could have killed him and he didn't. And Saul was like, oops. And then he's like, I, will, I won't harm you anymore. Hands off. I'm done. Right? Uh, David here um, doesn't believe him. And I think we learned that from the scripture today. We asked the question two weeks ago. I wonder what David really thought. Well, I think we learned here in 27 that he didn't believe him. He didn't trust him whatsoever. Um, So David here takes that belief, the belief that Saul is still after him and will kill him. David takes that belief to the next level. What has David been doing all up until this time? Minus a few slips, which we all had. As a whole, David had been trusting in God to deliver him. And we all need to do that, don't we? It's hard sometimes. It's really hard sometimes to trust God to deliver us when things are so difficult and so challenging. David had been trusting in God to deliver him, which again, time and time again, God had done. But David turns this corner here in chapter 27. He's diving into the wrong headspace, if you want to say it like that. David seems to have become discouraged, disheartened. He is despairing. David, you could say, is depressed here. In this chapter. So, so let's make six points this morning and let's walk through this. I think the theme of this morning is going to be this fantastically upbeat, happy, smiley, fun topic known as discouragement. I want to I raise a hand. I often say don't raise your hand, but I want to raise your hands now. Camera's not on you, I don't think. It doesn't matter. You don't have to give any details. 
clearly, is there anyone in here right now in any capacity that's going through a season of discouragement? Anybody? Look around, guys. Look around. And I know many probably aren't raising their hands. I'll raise mine. I'm not doing it just to be, make an example because I am. Do you want me to tell you about it? Well, I'm not going to, but anyway. A lot of hands went up. So, so this is real. And David, for David, it was real. He was in a season of discouragement. Let's see what God's word has to tell us about it. But look, first point, let's make some points here. Uh, point number one, discouragement is potent and it will cause us to make poor choices. Really didn't need to make that point. It's kind of obvious that happens, but let's start off the basics here. Discouragement is very potent. It's real and it will cause us to make some poor choices. I want to make a comment before we move on because I don't want to say something that I'm not saying or or have someone hear something that I'm not saying, rather. There's a reality uh, in the faith, in this faith walk called spiritual depression. I'm not going to let anybody tell me that's not real, because it is real, okay? Um, I personally have sought encouragement and counsel for it in my personal walk with the Lord, because there are times when we get spiritually depressed, okay? There's clinical depression. There's, there's, there's chemical imbalances that happen. These are two different entities, and they might be related and they might not be. I'm not going to speak from a doctor doctor's perspective because I don't understand that. What I'm, not, what I'm not pretending to do this morning, guys, and I want to make sure you understand me, and for those of you who are listening online, I am not the guy who's going to stand here and say, if you're down, just put your chin up and trust Jesus and everything will be okay. I'm not going to say that. There are those who struggle with depression and anxiety, and it's a real thing, so I'm not minimizing that. But the focus this morning I'm going to talk about is spiritual depression, okay? This is something that can happen. I think it's happening to David, and uh, that's what we want to kind of dissect this morning. So remember, do you guys remember the story in the Old Testament of Elijah and the prophets of Baal? Remember that? It was so cool. When we went to Israel, we got to go up on top of Mount Carmel where the showdown happened, you know. And here's, here's Elijah, and there, there are 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah was fed up with the Israelites. So he called them all up, and he said, listen, guys, you've got to make your minds up. If you're going to follow Baal, go follow Baal. If you're going to follow God, follow God. But we're going to put them to the test right now. So they erected this altar, and there were a couple of bulls, and he called all the prophets of Baal and said, get your altar ready and, and call out to your God and let him cry out uh, send down fire and see what happens. Well, they're, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff and they can't, they can't make anything happen. And Elijah was like, you know, you know, watch God, watch the real God show himself here. And they doused the fire three times. They doused the, the altar with water. And man, God just sent fire down and just lapped the whole thing up, man, consumed it. And then Elijah's like, go get them. So they went and got the 450 prophets of Baal and the story ended with a huge success for God and for Elijah. And then in the next chapter, Queen Jezebel is like, I'm going to get you, Elijah. So Elijah's like, and he runs off and hides in a cave. And he's like, oh, I'm going to die. God's like, what are you doing? First Kings 19.9 says the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here? How many times in the midst of our issues of our downness has the word of the Lord spoken to us and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm not mad at you, but what are you doing? There's something better for you. God's word comes to us in power in the same way. And we have to hear the same question being asked to us. John, what are you doing? What are you thinking? So the very opening of this chapter in verse 1, David said in his heart. Let's stop right there. David said in his heart. Maybe you're thinking something. or you're, Does anybody talk to themselves in their mind? Do you ever have conversations with an invisible entity that's not there, that never was there, but you're speaking anyway, and you're going down this rabbit trail, and you're talking? Who are you talking to? Who am I talking to? You know, what am I saying? But David was thinking in his heart. He said in his heart, what we dwell, guys, what we dwell on in our minds usually finds its way into our actions, into our lifestyles, and we've got to captivate our minds, okay? One of the things I used to tell the young people when I did youth ministry was this, and I think I can remember this, and I've shared it with you guys before, too, what you think oftentimes becomes what you say, can become what you do, and if we're not careful, can become who you are. What we think, what we say, what we do, and who. It starts to affect our identity. And David is thinking in his mind. He's thinking. He's, he's, he's thinking. Guys, the mind is a dangerous place. We don't need anybody to remind us of that, right? Our mind is a dangerous place, especially in moments of despair. Real quick, let's compare what Saul was saying. Excuse me. What David was saying, <laughs> I have to do that every Sunday because there's a few people who keep score how many times I get it wrong. So go ahead and put another little hashtag next to it, guys. 
Right? So <laughs> let's compare what David was saying to what he should have been saying. He said, I will perish by Saul. Did you read it in verse 1? He said, I will perish by Saul. No, David, God will preserve me. That's what he should have been saying. He, God had promised to. How else is he going to become king? If Saul kills him, he can't become king, and promise, God's promise would be null and void. So no, David, you're saying the wrong thing. I'm going to die by Saul. You're not going to die by Saul. God's got you. He's promised you. You're going to be king. Hold on to that promise. But in the mind, he's like, I'm going to die. And then what does he say? He said, there's nothing better for me to do then. I'm just stop right there. There's nothing better for me to do. Have we ever said that? I, mean, I just forget it. Might as well. There's nothing better for me to do. That's a lousy, horrible, horrible thing to say. He should have said, no, there is something. There's many things better for me to do. God has something better. What's the New Testament tell us? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized us except what is common to man. We're going to be tempted? Yep. Is God going to provide a way out? Yep. Why? So that we can fall down and cry? No, so that we can stand. There was a way out, David, okay? And there is something better for you to do. When we're thinking there's nothing better for me then, stop that, right? Because there is something better. Then he says, I might as well escape to the Philistines. Okay, so David, what you're saying is, it would be better for me to leave God's people, or at least those that are left that I'm around, and to go into the land of Israel's enemy. Because the Philistines were the enemy of God's people. We gave you guys the background on the Philistines some time ago. Remember the, the five Philistine cities, Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Gath. Gath was the hometown of Goliath, the champion. Uh, well, he runs to Gath. So I, it would be better for me to just go hang out in the enemy's camp. What? What? Are you serious? If you can't beat them, join them? No. No. This is not where we should ever be. There are those that are hearing my voice right now. You are looking for help in the enemy's camp. It's going to take you out. It's going to take us out. We can't. There's nothing there that's for our good. Run, run, run if you must for the rest of your life and never get a moment's rest, but never camp out with the enemy. That's not what we're to do. David says, Saul will despair. And I'm thinking, really? Saul doesn't care as long as you're gone. All Saul wants is for you to be gone. The enemy has no friends. And really, it shouldn't say that Saul was his enemy, but Saul was his enemy too. No, David, it's not Saul that's going to despair. You're going to despair. If you're going to go hang out with the enemy, you're going to despair. Sometimes we want so much to affect what other people are doing, and we want to affect their thinking, and we want to affect their actions, but, and we do something at the expense, at the detriment, at the demise of our own. You know, Don't worry about what they're, what they're going to think or what they're going to do. I need to focus on where God has me. And then he says, I shall escape out of his hand. Well, David... Um, if you read your New Testament, ha, 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 which he didn't have, of course. But we know that we can do nothing without Christ. And David could do nothing without God. And he thinks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the wool over Saul's eyes. I'm going to go hang out with the enemy. Saul's not going to follow me there, and I'm going to escape. Did David ever ask, God, is this okay with you? Are you okay with this, God? Guys, when we make a decision or we have a move or we are faced with something, before we do it, do we stop and look at the Lord and say, God, what do you think about this? As a matter of fact, Lord, what do you think about the way I'm thinking right now? Is this okay? See, we're not going to do that. Why? Because we know what God's going to say. What is he going to say? Stop it. So we don't want to go to God. And I, and, I, and, I, and I don't know. I might be wrong. You guys can talk about it in Thrive Group this week. I might be wrong. But I think there's a degree here that David is, I don't know, does David know that what he's doing is really not the best choice for him to make? We don't see any evidence in this chapter of him praying or seeking the Lord at all. I don't know. We've got to take our thoughts captive. Point number two. Let's, let's move on. When despair and discouragement come, we have to captivate our thoughts. We've got to, you know, we've got to captivate them. We've got to beat them down into submission. It's a very New Testament concept. Paul writes to Corinthians, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And he was talking about his own ministry and the power that he has um, in the Holy Spirit. Because, guys, if we obey our thoughts instead of obeying Christ, we lose. Right? 
We talked about following our heart a while back and what that could mean. What, what do we do when our heart is discouraged? Do we follow it? If we follow a discouraged heart, it will lead us down a destructive path, and we can't do that. We've got to captivate that. I, I like a guy. His name is uh, a guy. <laughs> his name is Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a pastor many, many years ago. Actually, he was at Westminster Chapel many, many years ago, early 1900s. He said something. We've got a quote for you, and I think we'll show this. But in part, he says this. He says, have you realized the most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. Now, that's a very small excerpt from a much larger quote that he had. We don't have time to read the whole thing. But, but you have to not listen to yourself, but you have to speak to yourself. Well, I just said earlier, we got to be careful because we're talking to ourselves. What are we saying? So Martin Lloyd-Jones is correct. We can't just listen to these voices in our head and obey them. We have to speak to ourselves. But the question is, what are we saying to ourselves? Because we could just nurture the thought that we're thinking and speak the wrong thing, and then we're still going to wind up in the wrong place. We'll, we'll qualify this just a little bit later in the message, but let's keep moving on here. So David's thinking here led to action. It says that he arose and he went to Achish, the king of Gath. The problem is, though, he took the 600 men with him. He took his loyal men with him. He was their captain. He was their leader, and they were following him. They were following his misleading. Point number three, when it comes to discouragement, when it comes to our actions, when I act on discouragement and despair, I usually end up taking someone with me. We never go alone. We never go down alone. Taking someone with me. Maybe you struggle with discouragement or bouts of discouragement in your own life. And you, you try to get through that without affecting those who you love. It's impossible. Because if they love you. You're going to take them with you. And it's not like you're trying to hurt them, but it's going to happen. And I don't think David was intentionally trying to hurt his men and the families here, but when David's going into the enemy camp, these 600 men are going with him. I don't want to lead my 600 loyal men into the enemy's camp. I shouldn't be going into the enemy's camp. You've got to be careful with that. Where am I going in my mind? Where am I going with my feet? What am I thinking? And more so, where am I taking the people around me? Where am I taking my wife and my family and my friends and my church family, you know? Am I taking them further away from God's people? Am I taking them into a den of idol worshipers? Where are we taking one another? And that's exactly where David was taking his, his family and his loyal men into a den of idol worshipers because he was despairing. So we take others with us. Remember, again, in chapter 26, David was lamenting the fact that he was pulled away from God's people, that he was pulled away from community, that he was pulled away from corporate worship, and yet here he's making the very choice for himself. You're not going to find the best living, spirit-filled church in Gath. <laughs> it's not the place to go. Yet that's where he went because he thought there was nothing better for him to do. Incidentally, verse 4, it says it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. So see, that's where the Holy Spirit says, oh, by the way, Saul still was hunting David. He had said, oh, I'm not going to harm you anymore, but it's very clear by that verse that he was still hunting him. And it was upon receiving word that David had escaped to Gath that Saul called off the chase. Finally, after all these years, he's not going to follow David into Gath. Just a little parenthesis there. Um, so David, David went to Gath. Here he is. Now, David had been to Gath before. Does anybody remember? Remember when he was in Gath before? Back in chapter 21, David had fled to Gath, the city of Goliath, before. And when he was there, now, it, at the first time he was there, it had been about four years or so since he had killed Goliath. And remember, he fled from Saul to Gath, but when the people who were there recognized him, he became afraid. Remember that? David, they, they, they became afraid when they recognized that it was David. So David, what did he do? He pretended to be a madman. And Achish, the king said, get that man out of here. You know, I don't need his likes here. Um, so, so here we are again in chapter 27. Um, it's been about four more years 
Okay, so it's been four years since he had been there before, and we find him in Achish, or rather in Gath with Achish again. And David thinks it's going to work out better this time than it did the first time, right? It's like, okay, the, the, the Goliath thing has been settled. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not salivating at the beard anymore and running like a madman. Maybe it'll be better this time. Uh, guys, insanity, it has been said, is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. David had gone to the enemy's <clears throat> camp once. It didn't go well, but here four years later, he thinks it's going to work out for him. Well, let's see how this works out for him. Now, this time, unlike the previous time, because David didn't have saliva in his beard and he wasn't foaming at the mouth and acting like a madman because he was being you know, chased by Saul, this time uh, David didn't act that way. Achish did not kick him out. Again, David didn't act like a madman, but if you think about it, actually, he may have been more mad this time than he pretended to be the last time. Why in the world are you thinking you're going to set up camp here, right? And so, did, and here's the thing as I read this. It's like, did Achish remember that? Did Achish remember David from, from four years prior? Like, isn't this the guy that was the madman? Like, but I think da- Achish was very opportunistic, and we're going to see that uh, this, this time as it's a little bit different. So watch this. Both David and Achish did not like Saul. It was very clear. And Achish had heard everything that Saul had been doing to, to David. Achish knew that, um, that Saul was chasing David. So Achish is like, hey, here's an opportunity, right? He knew Saul hated David and Achish hated Saul. So what is he thinking here? This king, this Philistine, this idol-worshiping Philistine king, thinks he's going to take David and his 600 men and use them for his own mission against Saul. Now, maybe militarily that might be a cool thing to do, but when you're a man of God in the enemy's camp, you're going to get used, David. The enemy wants to use you. Guys, if we're hanging out in the camp of the enemy and they're trying to talk smack and be all cool and, oh, here's what I have to offer you, and you go home and you think about it in the quiet recesses of your closet, and you're like, oh, yeah, there's some good in this for me. There's no good in this for me. The enemy wants to use you, and he'll get what he can get out of you, and he'll spit you out because that's what he does. Point number, what are we on? No, we're not. I told the folks at the tech table, here's what happened. This is what happens when you get your notes to the church secretary before you actually finish your message. So we're not on point four. We're going to skip point four and go to point five. Okay. All right. So just it's the way it works sometimes in reality. (laughs) Okay. Point number five, when we cave to discouragement, the enemy will use us. When we cave to discouragement, the enemy will use us. Now, for those of you who are craving order right now, Have no fear. We will go back and do number four. There's nothing spiritual about the fact that the note sheets had already been printed before I made this change, so it's okay. But if we cave, and when we cave to discouragement, the enemy is going to use us. Guys, we're going to read more in chapter 29, but here's, and we get a little bit into it at the beginning of 28. We'll finish it up in a few weeks. But Achish, the king he, and the Philistines, they're preparing for a great battle. And this great battle is going to be against Israel. It's going to be against Saul. It's going to take place on Mount Gilboa. And we'll read about that. But at this point in time, Achish looks at David and looks at his men and goes, Oh, yeah. Oh, hi, David. You know that Randy Newman song? You got a friend in me. That's what Achish was singing, right? He was like, Oh, David, I, uh, come on, man. Come on in. You know, he was using him. He was using him. We don't want to be in that situation. Look, when we're down, we're actually drafted into the enemy's army. We can be. He'll draft us in. And in this warped state of mind that we can find ourselves in, that can do more damage to God's people. And it can really contribute to a win for the enemy. And we don't want to do that. David's getting ready to, to, to link arms with the enemy against his own people. Just, he's really digging, he's dug a hole here. What's going to happen? We're going to find out. Not today, but we'll find out. Moments of regret when we look back on episodes like this in our life. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We, we don't want to create more moments of regret when we're making decisions like this in a warped state of mind. Now, it's interesting here. David, it tells us David didn't want to live near Achish. Okay, so he's hanging out. So David's got, a, he's, David's crafty. David's being crafty here. And he had his own mission that he wanted to keep secret from Achish. 
David was pretending, oh, well, you know, it would be dishonorable for me to live in the royal city with you, King Achish. So, um, you know, which I'm sure Achish would have been like, oh, oh, yeah, I am the king, aren't I? You know, that would have made him feel real good. But, but, but Achish was glad, it says, to give him Ziklag. So basically, the king, uh, Achish, gave David this place to, to live called Ziklag. It's a city, and it was actually a city God had given the Israelites anyway. Um, it had been taken. It had been given to Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, but the Philistines had stolen it. God was giving it back, but this is a, a weird situation that's, that's going on here. So what David was doing, as we've read this morning, is David was raiding some of the ites, the, you know, the ites, the Amalekites, who were the foes of God's people. They were the enemy. And, and back in Deuteronomy, in several places in the earlier part of the Old Testament, when God had given the promised land to his people, what did he tell them to do? He, he said, you need to drive the Canaanites, the Amalekites, all those ites, all those enemies to, the, to the, the code of God, if you will. Drive them out. I'm giving you this land. And they didn't do that. They didn't drive out. They didn't dispossess the people and take full possession of what God had called them to. And that trickled down and it became problems for generations to follow. So in a way, David is, so David's taken these guys out here. In a way, you could say, okay, well, that's a good thing. Um, God had told him to do that anyway. But the way he's doing this, because notice, notice, what he's, he's doing here. Even though there's a degree that these ites should be taken out, David wants to make Achish think that he's actually attacking his own people, Judah. Now, now because Achish would say, well, where have, you, where have you made a raid today? And David's like, um, uh, Judah. Dude, so you killed your own people? That's not what he was doing. But he wanted Achish to think that while he was doing this other thing. Now, some might go, well, you know, that's a good reason. You know, he lied a little, but that's okay because at least something good came of it. Is it ever good to lie? Is it ever good to be straight out deceptive in this way? Talk about that in your thrive group this week, right? Um, lots here to think about. And we've actually done that before. We've talked about that. But look, this move, this move that David had made into the enemy's camp it was a move that started with him being discouraged. What I think is clear here is it's digging a deeper hole for David. It really is. Um, David destroyed every living being. He took out every man, every woman of these ites. He just destroyed them. Because he thought he was doing good for God? Was David thinking, well, I'm finally going to take out these Amalekites, which my people should have done before me? Is that what he's thinking? Maybe some, maybe not. But Scripture tells us that he did this so that there would be no survivors to come back and go, no, here's really what he's doing. He didn't want to get told on. Are you guys tracking? This is, like a, there's, this is kind of like a lot of deception going on in this chapter. You know, and we don't want to kick David to the curb for being a, a bad guy. You know, we know he's struggling. We know he's down. But David didn't want any survivors to squeal on his mission. He wanted to keep this thing a secret, and he did, because it tells us at the end that Achish trusted him, Achish believed him. He succeeded in doing this. But look at, back at verse 5, just the wording here. David, David says this to Achish. He says, if I have found favor in your eyes. Now, let's think about that for a second. Some might say, well, yeah, he's just being, he's just being deceptive. It's okay. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. He called himself Achish's servant. It's like, why would you even want to seek the favor of this man? Why would you even want to partner with him? He's a pagan enemy of God's people. He's a pagan enemy of you. And you want to partner with him? You want to be known as his servant? You want to find favor in his eyes at all or even pretend to? I think this is a little bit of a, a low point here. Uh, I think it speaks to what we can get ourselves into when, when we're discouraged. We can start to become buddy-buddy with the world. And when we're buddy-buddy with the world, we're walking down the wrong, the wrong path. What does Jesus say? He says, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. And it's almost like David was trying to have his feet in both streams here. If you're going to serve the Philistines, David, you're not serving God. If you're going to be a servant of Achish, you're not going to be a servant of God. You know, it can't be both. Yes, God is on the throne, and yes, God's grace will overrule, but is your heart loyal to the true God right now, David, and what you're doing? 
I love what Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is disgraceful even to mention the things that such people practice in secret. And that's kind of what David is doing here. He's, he's like, Hey, I'm going to hang out with this man who propagates deeds of darkness. Really? Right? We don't have time to get into the paganism of, of, the, uh, of the Philistines, but it was rampant. Now, here's our disorder change, <laughs> okay? Let's go back and do point number four that we skipped. Discouragement will often lead me to compromise. And that's kind of think that's what David was doing here. I'm not saying no good came out of it, but I think David compromised big time. Do we ever want to put ourselves in a place of compromise um, for the inevitable glory of God? I don't think I want to say that. I'm willing to compromise if God gets the glory. No. I'm willing to compromise if God's grace is greater. N- no. You know, huh. I'm willing to be used by the enemy if God gets the glory in the end. No. <laughs> yes, God gets the glory. Yes, his grace is greater. Yes, he's a forgiving God. But we don't walk into those situations like that. So Achish believed him. Now look at how this ends, and we'll finish with this. And then I have some application for us, and then we'll close in worship and song. This big battle is coming. You can hear the drumbeat in the background of the movie score here. It's a big battle. And, and um, you know, no, no surprise ending if you guys have read ahead. Saul's going to die in this battle. He's going to be killed. They're going to hang his body. We got to see the temple area where his body was hung. That was so cool. We'll show you pictures when we get there. But Achish tells David, hey, you're going to go out to battle with me. And David's like, is he gulping here? Is he like... Oh, yeah, I'm going to go fight and kill the, uh, my people. See, he had told Achish that's what he had been doing. Oh, I've been f- making raids in, in, in Judah. Okay, well, then let's really make a raid. Let's go into full-out war. What's David going to do? David felt before the sting of betrayal. Remember back in, when he saved Keilah, and then after that, the folks of Keilah turned their backs on him? David knew what it was like to be betrayed. We're going to see a lot more of that in David's life, by the way, when we get into 2 Samuel. But even in the state of despair, could he really turn and fight against his own people? Could he really do that? Would he do that? David is in a very sticky predicament here. The question is, are you going to fight for Achish? Are you going to get drafted into his army? Are you going to take your own people out and all this started because you were discouraged? Oh, wow. Last point, number six. Discouragement can lead us into precarious predicaments. As if we didn't think it was bad enough. It only gets worse. God stopped the cycle. Let me ask you guys this morning as we finish here. David, David was discouraged. He had seen God working in his life. He had seen God's faithfulness. He felt the pangs of not being able to be in the assembly, not being able to worship. He longed for the tabernacle, if you will. He longed for Christian community, if you will. He longed to be in a church where he was loved and known. He longed to be in a group where people could come around him and care for him. He longed for these things. And yet, here, in a moment of discouragement, thinking Saul was going to take him out, he's like, there's nothing better for me to do. A.K.A. throwing in the towel. How many of you guys, don't raise your hand, have just wanted to throw in the towel sometimes? I just, there's nothing more I can do. And you're about to step into a situation that's going to lead to this kind of predicament that David finds himself in right now. What is discouraging you this morning? For all of you who raised your hands, for all of us who raised our hands, what is discouraging you? Is it fatigue? Is it frustrations? Are there some fears? There's much we can be afraid of, is it not? A lot of big, real things can cause us to fear. You know, the little child, don't be afraid of the boogeyman. He's not there. Explain that to your little child, right? There's a lot that we can be afraid of. It can lead to discouragement. Where are we allowing these thoughts to take us? David said in his mind, what are we saying in our mind? What are we saying in our minds? Are we talking about it to anybody? Or are we trying to fight it alone, right? Are you responding the same way each time this discouragement comes, expecting different results? 
Well, let me try this again. I'm going to give it my best shot. Oh, I've given it my best shot. Time and time again, it doesn't work. My best shot doesn't work. We can't do that. Are you listening to the voices in your head or are you speaking to yourself? Are you preaching to yourself? Joan said, are you hearing from the word of God? I don't care what I think. It doesn't matter what I think. I don't care what they tell me on TV. I don't care what the best sellers tell me, even the Christian ones. I mean, I'm not saying they're bad. They're not. They're good. I, I need to care what does this say? What is he saying to me? And I can tell you guys right now, for me, when I started reading this last Monday after Elvis left and I saw verse 1 and it said, David said in his heart, the first thing that came to my mind is the Holy Spirit said, yeah, John, what are you saying in your heart right now? I'm like, Ugh. God, did you hear that? He's like, yeah, I heard it. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, my Holy Spirit is speaking to you, John. Listen to my word. What are you saying? We got to captivate these things, don't we? I threw this on those guys back at the table, and I hope they got it. I did it at the last minute this morning. I'm going to do five R's. These are not in your note sheet. Write them down if you want. If not, don't tune out for the next three minutes, okay? Here's some things we need to do, I think, when it comes to discouragement. By the way, this is not a self-help sermon. This is chapter 27 of, of, of the book of 1 Samuel in God's holy word, okay? But I think we can glean some, a little bit more. We can squeeze a little bit more from this. Number one, it's five R's. The first thing we need to do is recognize. We need to recognize that discouragement is real. It's real. I, I mentioned Psalm 42 to you guys earlier. Psalm 42, the first four verses. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you, God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. The writer of that psalm wasn't like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm okay. Praise the Lord, good morning, God is good, amen, I'm okay. He didn't do that. We can't deny it. We got to recognize that discouragement is real. We got to look at it and say, yeah, this is discouragement and it is real. And guys, let me just say a word here. For those of you who believe, well, if I'm discouraged, I just must not have enough faith. Come on. There's nobody who has enough faith, if that's true. We all get discouraged. So we have to recognize it. Second thing we, need, we should do is we need to refresh our minds. We need to refresh our minds. We need to cleanse our minds. There are some things we need to put off. You know, Ephesians 4, I think it is. There's some things we need to put on. There's some things we need to put off. Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We need that. We just need, we need that rest. We need that refreshment. Hebrews 12, lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely or so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. We need to lay aside every weight. We need to lay aside the sin, the stuff that's bringing you down. If it's social media, unplug it. Whatever it is, get it off. We got to refresh our minds and get out of this pit that we can find ourselves in. Let the Lord cleanse us. Third, third R, very akin to the second one, we need to renew our minds. We need to have our minds renewed, I should say. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So we get this transformation that takes place in our life. That transformation comes as a result of having our minds renewed, and that is happening by the Spirit and the Word of God. So we have to have our minds re renewed. And then the fourth R, okay, these are all very closely related. We need to reset our minds, okay? We've got this refreshing that happens. Our minds are renewed, and that's a constant process, which never ends, by the way. But we constantly also have to hit the reset button. You guys ever hit a reset button on an electronic device? Sometimes you just can't troubleshoot it. You just got to reset it, okay? You know what I mean? I used to have computer problems all the time. And it wouldn't print, and it wouldn't do this, it wouldn't do that. And I asked the guy who did our computer stuff, I'm like, what is wrong with my computer? It's broken. And he's like, no, it's not broken. Just turn it off and turn it back on. And I'm like, well, surely that's not it. I've tried everything uh, except that. 
And I turned it off and turned it back on, and it works just fine, right? Because it needs to be reset, and we need to do that sometimes. I like Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just and pure and lovely and commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set our minds on those things. Isaiah 26, 3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is set or stayed on you because he trusts in you. So what am I focusing on? What is my mind anchored to? Colossians 3 says to set my mind on things above, not on things of this earth. If we're setting our minds on the wrong things, we need to reset our minds on the right things. And then the last one, we can do this. Guys, we can really do this. Resist the devil. Resist. The fifth R is resist the devil and he might flee from you. Resist the devil and he will more than likely Good Lord willing in the creek don't rise. Flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee. Am I resisting the devil? Am I resisting the devil or am I trying to make a bargain with Achish? What am I doing? Am I drifting? Am I thinking everything's going to be okay? Guys, I can't resist the enemy without Christ as my Savior and Lord. First of all, right there. And that is full surrender. Full surrender. So unlike David this morning, don't let your heart be ruled by actions that, that, that flow from what you see. We sang about that this morning in the second song we sang this morning. I'm going to walk over here just a little bit. Um, where is all the music from this morning, Lucas? In your head. He memorizes everything. That guy's amazing. No, I, I just, I, I want to read this because it's important. I don't know whose this is, but I'm messing your music up. I'm kidding. I'm not. Um, See, this is why I should prepare better. But no, I just thought about this when we sang this morning. I'm going to find those lines. Bear with me, guys. I won't bow to idols. I'm not going to Philistines. I'm not going to bow to, to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. I won't be formed by feelings. Pastor John didn't sing that line this morning. Why? Because I often... Allow myself to get formed by feelings. And I'm going to stop that. Can we stand together? I'm going to read this verse. I don't know if you got this either. Psalm 42, worship team, come up. I want to read. So go home and meditate on Psalm 42. Let me just tell you that. Go home and meditate on Psalm 42. But we're going to read this verse together from Psalm 42. We're going to read it aloud, uh, and then I'm going to pray. Let's read this together. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And listen, if you're here this morning and he is not your salvation, and you're lamenting like the psalmist, why, why am I so down? What is going on in me? And you do not have to start with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've not embraced him as your Savior and Lord, then I'm just going to tell you, do it this morning. If the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart right now that you've tried it all, and we've said this many times, guys, and you, you just can't get it done yourself, and, and you've run to the Philistine camp thinking that's going to help you, and now it's dawning on you that, oh my goodness, I'm in a much worse place than I was before. We don't need to run to the Philistine camp. We don't need to run to the world. We need to run to Jesus. He died on the cross to rescue us from this mess. And he wants to make you a brand new creation. And if you're not a new creation and you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you now to surrender once and for all your life to Jesus Christ, I really just want to challenge you to come up front and pray. Grab one of us as elders. Pray with us this morning before you leave, even during this final time of worship, because you want to leave here knowing, even if you have your Philistine and your Achish moments, that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, and he will see you through. But we can't do it without him. 
We need him in our life. And if you're just discouraged and he is your Savior and Lord and you are doing the first R and you're recognizing that it's real and you would like to pray with someone or you would just like to come up here and just sit or bow or kneel and just intercede for yourself, if you just want to do that wherever you are, spend this time at his feet. Father, thank you that you meet us in our discouragement. Thank you that you who is in us is greater than the one that is in this world. And may we look only to you. Lord, lift us out of the miry clay. Set our feet on the rock, Lord. We need you. We pant for you. We long for you like the deer pants for streams of living water. Lord, re restore us, refresh us, renew us, revive us, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.